All right, uh, we're gonna give this a shot. This is gonna be the, uh, the first inaugural uh, attempt at this, just to see if uh, anybody actually cares about watching something get painted and maybe they'll pick up a few techniques. Lord knows I don't profess to be uh, an expert, but uh, you know, I've been doing it for a while. So um, tonight's victim is gonna be uh, this uh, space jockey uh, model that I 3D printed. Um, now a model I found on, uh, on Thingiverse um, from the very first uh, Alien movie designed by H.R. Uh, uh, Geiger. So, um, basic color scheme for this sucker. Uh, we're gonna be doing um, gunmetal uh, all through the base and all through this whole portion here. And then uh, main body here and here will all be uh, bone. So uh, I think we're just gonna go straight to airbrushing some gunmetal. Um, I've already gone through and uh, primed and base coated the sucker earlier this week. Um, and we'll be using uh, army painter, uh, war paints. Typically when I do uh, metallics, I uh, usually stick with um, Model Master um, metalized lacquers. Um, I like the way that they spray. Um, but when I swap back to bone, um, I'm gonna be using uh, Army Painter paints for it. So I happen to have this bottle of gunmetal here. I've never used it. Um, we're gonna give it a shot and see how the finish matches up uh, with the Model Master stuff. So let's get it shook up real good. I do about 20 drops um, of base paint, um, set it off to the side, and then uh, I run this uh, Vallejo air airbrush, air blush, sorry it's been a long day, airbrush flow improver, and so um, I'll typically, uh, oh, So on your airbrush, if you jam your finger up against the tip, you can let a little bit of air, and if you pull back, it's not gonna spray anything. The air's gonna go the opposite direction. Now obviously, um, don't do this with your cap on. It's gonna put so much air pressure that this is gonna go flying. You're gonna spew paint all over the place. Um, you're gonna waste paint. You're not gonna be happy with yourself. But you do wanna get the two um, mixed together somewhat. And then you can slap it on here. I'll do it quick. Test spray. Yeah, all right, let's see where this goes. I figure with this gray undercoat, um, it should make for a good base with this where it'll be really subtle. Um, and obviously, you know, the trick with most of these paint jobs is knowing what your final color scheme is gonna be. That affects what color primer you use. Um, obviously, if you're gonna go dark, the last thing you wanna do is do a white primer um, and vice versa, quite frankly. Um, although with dark colors, you can usually you know, get away with, with quite a bit more because they, they cover better. But in this case, knowing this is going to go gunmetal, a nice gray works like a champ. And we'll see where it goes. Now the trick to a good paint job too is, is knowing that the more layers, the better. Um, 
you know, you you may start off with your initial batch of primer, and then you'll come through, you know, with a base coat, um, or you may do both in in one shot, um, depending on the products that you're using. Um, more often than not, regardless of what paint I'm using, I end up using a Rust-Oleum uh, high build primer. Um, it usually comes in a gray or a, or a, a dark red. Um, it's like a flat red, kind of like a clay red. Um, and then, you know, like for a project like this, I'll go back through and I'll and I'll top coat it. You got to be real careful uh, what paints you choose. You know, keep a keep a mental log, keep a written log of what works with what. Uh, occasionally, you'll run into paints that, man, chemically they just do not like each other. Uh, you're gonna hose yourself real quick. And a model like this, it, it's kind of a one shot deal. Uh, trying to go back through and restrip this to put a good paint job on it the second time through. Um, yeah, have fun with that one. That's uh, that's gonna get miserable real quick. Uh, but in the meantime, when we talk about layering, you know, by the time we're looking at it here, you're talking about a layer of primer, um, a layer of base coat, um, now a layer of this gun metal. Um, once we're done with this gun metal, depending on coverage, um, we'll come back through, uh, do another coat. Um, although, looking at it now, to be honest, I don't think it's going to need it. Um, we'll probably come back through, um, airbrush uh, a slightly darker color we'll mix up um, to kind of get in the nooks and crannies. Um, then we'll move on to the bone, and the bone there again is probably going to be two, three layers of a little bit of mix and match to, uh, to get the, the right color and the right shading. And then we'll do a relatively dark wash uh, over the whole thing. Um, I'll probably do a medium uh, wash over the bone portion. Uh, and then I'll probably do a little bit of a rust wash. Um, if you look at the original, uh, you know, you get a little bit of, of, of ancient rust because God knows how long the, uh, the ship has crashed, right? Um, the other thing to consider too is how long it's been skid sitting. Um, it looks like there's there's physically dust on it. Um, I may have to take a look, see if I've got a little bit of fuller's earth sitting around. That's usually a really nice technique for giving it a little bit of, of age and, and dust in the nooks and crannies. If I don't, which I'm not sure that I do, I'll figure that stuff out when I get to it. Sometimes that's just the way this stuff goes. I very much like these Army Painter paints. Uh, they're so incredibly easy to work with. Um, I have to say for, for years, I painted almost exclusively in testers uh, uh, paints and Model Master paints. And quite frankly, you know, there again, know your paints. Uh, there's a time and a place for everything, regardless of, you know, whether you wanna go with an oil base, whether you wanna go with uh, water base. Um, the water base is just sheer convenience. It's easy and quick cleanup. It's quick turnaround time for your airbrush if you know you're going to be uh, rocking multiple colors. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, I like Army Painter paints. Uh, they're a fraction of the cost uh, from the Vallejo stuff. The Vallejo stuff is, is great. Um, there's certainly no complaints in that department. Um, but I don't have any complaints about the Army Painter paints either. It, uh, it get, like I said, it, it just goes down really nice and smooth. It's very subtle. And it really doesn't take much. Um, you know, even already there, you can, you can totally see the difference. Um, I think just initial knee-jerk reaction, I, I prefer uh, the metallic. Uh, look that I get with the with the model masters um, I think an oil based when it comes to metallics I just I just prefer oil based it's, you know, it's my own personal preference um, but to each their own there there may be others that you know that like it the other way around um, at this point here you know I feel pretty well committed um, you just remember that you can always do you know your water based over your oil based um, but not vice versa not if you want the paint to, to do well. So having uh, 
Having started with this metallic, I'm a bit committed now at this point. And that's all right. Once it's once it's done, it'll it'll look just fine. This was uh, more a test. Otherwise, I probably would have never used the paint. And I'll use it again. I like the look of it. Um, I think that. Uh, as much pop when you're done. Now, I don't go hog wild with it, you know, I like, um, you know, I stay consistent with it. Um, it's easy to lay down way too much paint if you're not careful. Um, typically on uh, on my airbrush, I keep this set so that I can only go back so far on the trigger. Um, the further back you go, obviously, the, the more paint is going to flow. Um, I'd just rather save myself from myself, especially uh, doing this after a long day's worth of work. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to get real carried, carried away and all of a sudden put way too much paint down. Um, so I found a sweet spot with uh, with my airbrush. Um, it dries really nice, really quickly. Um, I mean, you can come back through and, and touch on it and there's no danger you know, of uh, leaving your fingerprints. Although I'm sure I'm gonna leave my, <laughs> I'm sure I'm gonna leave my fingerprints in this sooner or later. I don't think there's anything I've ever built that I haven't at least left my fingerprints uh, in or on or have left part of my DNA on because invariably I end up super gluing my fingers to the damn thing at, at some point or another. I think it just goes with the territory. Um, the other nice part about setting your, uh, setting your airbrush flow is it uh, it also gives you a, a lot of control to ensure uh, that, you know, not only are you not just lumping the paint on, um, it gives you a chance to atomize really nice and clean, um, but it also gives you control to get really up close to a surface that you may not want to paint that color. And you don't have to be exact but it minimizes the potential for really just having a, a ton of, of overflow. And so, you know, take this for example, where I know that I'm gonna keep this bone, but like this particular surface right here, I wanna keep it um, gunmetal. And there again, you know, if you look at, at officially licensed replicas, the details here um, are, are, are not similar. Um, the body actually ends up flowing a little bit more this way. The bone color continues on up. Um, it's not a 100% accurate model, but you know what, it's, it's close enough. I, I like the look of it, I'm just not, um, I'm just not a perfectionist when it comes to this, uh, to this shit. And so my, uh, my inclination is, rather than worrying about perfection, knowing that I'm already starting with a lack of perfection, I'd rather just paint according to the lines of the model and, and make it look good. Um, and so, as you can see, with that, you know, and I'm running probably about um, 45 to 48 PSI on this. Um, so I apologize if my uh, compressor gets cranked up here um, in fairly short order. Um, it goes off every once in a while and it's, uh, it's deafening. Um, but it, it seems to be just the sweet spot to where I can run a nice clean line like that and not, not just blow out the model. And there again, um, I apologize for camera angles and for lighting. Um, this is my first time doing this. Um, 
If you're not interested, you've probably <laughs> you've probably already moved on or never even never even clicked the link by the time this thing gets uploaded. But uh, if you have stuck around, um, cool. You know, um, I like uh, I like sharing uh, knowledge and techniques. Um, I spend as much time. Uh, every time I get interested in something new or some new tool or some new technique, I spend as much time on YouTube as I'm sure most other makers do, um, as it's just a great, all, uh, awesome tool to, to learn new stuff. Um, and you know, realistically, most of what I'll cover, I'm sure someone else has covered. Hell, I'm sure they've probably done it better. Um, but it's, uh, it's cranking out, uh information right there can never be too much information um too much of a of a good source um so hopefully you learn something um don't be shy about posting feedback if you see something that you're like hey that's a really janky way of doing it um pipe up because uh who knows i might read it and go oh well hell i never even thought of doing it that way um i think that's what i like the most about about this sort of thing is just the uh kind of putting yourself out there and uh you know if you get a chance to to learn something great i don't know about you guys i like learning something new every day doesn't matter what it is like a sponge if uh if you could just uh borrow or i guess copy the information out of each other's brains Uh, pick up a new skill that'd be swell so i you know it, 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 it's a little bit of knowledge about the tool that you're using um it's a little bit of technique i think a lot of people get really psyched out and honestly you can go out and spend you know get on amazon you can pick up you know an airbrush like this for You know, I think between that and um, and a wet palette, um, which feel free to search that if you're interested in hand painting uh, models, especially when it, uh, you know as, when this pertains to, to water-based paints, um, a wet palette is single-handedly one of the, the coolest things that you can uh, you can have in your arsenal. It uh, it's just a real game changer. So yeah, I'm a. I mean, you can see the old finish there. Again, you know, just uh, just look at the model. Um, think about um, what the function is. You know, something as simple as this. Once you start getting into that in-between zone, and you're going, okay, well, what gets painted next? You know, it's, it's clearly he's got a, a handle coming up and out of his hand. So that's that's your line of uh, of segregation on this to to know. Here's my start and my stop points. Um, That's all right. Sometimes that's the way it goes. You know, the trick is just not having. Uh... In this case, you know, even with the bone going over that silver, quite honestly, um, we'll probably do a couple passes on the bone. And really, it takes you know four or five different techniques to get bone uh, looking right anyway. Um, so I'm not too terribly worried about you know the transition between the gray and the silver. It's so minute. Um, that it's not going to show through on the final paint job.
it's very interesting to me, and I've always found this to be the case over the years, um, when I'm working on a, on a model or, you know, no, we'll just stick with models for the sake of conversation. It, um, you, you never, no matter how many, how long you stare at this model, um, you'll never see it in the same light and your brain won't process it the same way as you do once you start painting it. Um, it's kind of the equivalent of listening to the same piece of music 300 times and then going and playing it on something like, you know, Rock Band or Guitar Hero, where all of a sudden your brain is just processing something in a way complete, on a completely different level. Um, than you normally otherwise would. And I like that. Um, it forces me to, to sometimes notice these details where I go, oh, that's really cool. I, I've missed that all these times. Um, or just see it in a different light that kind of goes, huh, it's a little bit of insight into someone else's brain um, and to their, their design uh, approach. Uh, it's cool. I don't think I ever get tired of Seeing any kind of uh, prop or sculpture or anything else because it's always this super interesting, you know, like I said, uh, insight into their brain and where it's at. So I think we're gonna let's pop the top off of the sucker. Yeah, let's give ourselves a little bit more paint here. You know, realistically, paint's one of those things that, uh, fuck it, I'm gonna eyeball it. Um, paint's one of those things, you know, it's, it's 90, 90% prep, um, and then, uh, you know, let's say 1.5%, you know, patience, you just gotta, gotta be patient, you gotta take time with your layers, um, with some of these, you know, they dry so super fast, um, it affords you the luxury to, uh, you know, work on a model, and by the time you've moved on to another part and finished up with it, the first part's dry, so you can... You can really work some some pretty cool uh, some pretty cool magic um, with this stuff. Oh, that's my wife. Well, I'm gonna pause this and I'm gonna come back to it. All right. So that was a nice little end of day meet and greet. Uh, airbrushes primed and prepped and ready. I sat and watched the first half of this just out of curiosity, just to. Uh, to see uh, how it looked. And you know, outside of uh, the orientation, it being in portrait mode, I'm hoping uh, I can fix that and uh, some self-top post-processing. I don't know, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. Just the way of it, it's new, new territory. But um, you know, in the meantime, we got the uh, got a good coat going on the base. Um, I'm digging this color. I think it works, you know, we're probably about 10 minutes away. And, um, and it had a good chance to, to dry. So that's definitely a nice big upside like I was talking about earlier, um, is by the time you wrap up with one spot, you know, it gives you that, it affords you that opportunity to then come come back and, and continue on with minimal downtime. So um, we'll continue uh, spraying this gunmetal and then uh, move on to, to tackling the bone. So let's get on with it. Um, you know, typically I'm, I'm keeping uh, my airbrush rough, uh, roughly, uh, let's say, you know, half an inch to uh, three quarters of an inch um, away. Um, on a two-stage airbrush like this, uh, if you're not familiar with one, um, with this particular hookup, I've got a quick disconnect here. And although I've got a regulator on my air compressor to limit um, the amount of, of, of pressure that it's allowing down the line, um, this uh, valve here gives me a little bit more fine control over it so that I can limit it further or increase. Um, <clears throat> uh, this knob uh, here uh, designates how far back you can tilt uh, your spray knob and this is what's called a, uh, uh, a two-stage airbrush, um, meaning that uh, when you press down on the nozzle that opens the valve which allows the air to flow and then when you tilt back on it it then controls how much paint 
flows down out of this pot, which then hits that air and blows down your needle um, to then come out of the airbrush. So it gives you a lot of really fine control. I ran a single stage for, for years, um, and it was a, a, a bottom fed, so you had your separate paint jars. Um, truth be told, I actually found that it was uh, more hassle than it was worth, and if I have a tool that is a pain to use, more often than not, I end up not using it. So I actually walked away from it for, for quite some time. Um, so it wasn't uh, too terribly long ago that I, that I bought this two-stage, um, and I gotta say, it is nothing but sheer pleasure to use. It just makes this whole process um, so much easier. Um, and there again, you know, there's a there's a time and a place for, for everything. It's nice to lay your base coats down um, by airbrush. Um, and you can run a project from start to finish on airbrush. Um, I've done that as well. Um, but more often than not, I find that uh, that I come back and I, I do, you know, there, there are a lot of brush techniques that you can do for the follow-up layers. And like we were talking about, you know, know going in that if you want a really good paint job um, in order to achieve that sense of depth uh, that's where the layers come in uh, you really you know want to on a piece like this you, you know it's old it's been sitting there for a long time and it's mechanical so you want to have that sense of you know grime down in the nooks and crannies and I think that's probably what has kept me over the years um, away from creatures and more in the um, you know, science fiction, uh, firearms, or spaceships, or, you know, uh, cosplay, uh, cosplay, uh, 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 scene has been, um, the excuse that, you know, unless you're a sheer perfectionist who, who likes to just kill yourself over the fine details, and there's a lot of folks that are like that, and more power to them. Um, for the rest of us who, quite frankly, have neither the, the drive nor the motivation to try and achieve that level of perfection, um, invariably you're going to fuck something up somewhere. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, and when you go, not only do I aesthetically really like um, things that look uh, grimy and dingy and, you know, chipped and beaten up, um, and used, um, for me it adds a whole feeling of realism to the prop or the piece that you're working on. It adds a level of believability to it and uh, it serves a practical purpose as well because it gives you that ability to hide and fudge your mistakes to where chances are you're going to be the only one that really spots it unless it's under a well a uh, knowledge to I and the hurdle is to recognize those people and keep your stuff very far away from them <laughs> or or suck it up and just take the critique you know you can only make excuses for yourself so much um, but at the end of the day you know who cares what anyone else thinks about your paint job but you know do you like it are you happy with it did you have fun with it um, I mean the whole point of stuff like this none of us are getting paid to do it um, you do it because you enjoy it and because at the end you've got a thing and uh, I don't care how many other people have printed out and if they've magically hit the correct number to do it at the same scale as you they haven't painted it the way that you have so you've created this one of one thing that no one else has um, and that's pretty cool I like custom shit like that I think that's my biggest motivation I don't think there's a single item that I own outside of like my socks and my underpants that uh, I haven't modified in some way, shape, or form to own it, to make it my own. Um, so this kind of ties in with uh, what we were talking about earlier about recognizing your start and finish points. Um, you know, looking at uh, one of the officially licensed models, um, the pictures of it just for frame of reference. Um, you know, you can see parts that I probably would have knee-jerked painted uh, metallic uh, gunmetal right off the bat. I'm going to stop calling it gunmetal. I don't actually feel like it is gunmetal. All right, moot point. Sidetrack. Um, you know, looking for where the transition points on it um, is super, super interesting um, so that you get a general feel of, you know, what should be what and, and what the, 
the final composition pieces like um, you know bear in mind even on a uh, for, for basic paint jobs um, the general rule of thumb uh, for whatever reason um, it comes in threes um, a base you know uh, a secondary accent uh, uh, a third color um, for whatever reason there's something about the way the human brain processes colors um, a, a bare minimum of, uh, of of three colors seems to make a piece pop and and, and be really interesting. Um, you know, basic painting 101 techniques. Uh, know your color families. Know uh, which colors go go well together. Um, and quite honestly, not everyone has the knack for recognizing that. Um, but it is something that can be learned. Um, YouTube, Google. Um, there's a lot of knowledge base out there that will help clue you in. Um, get yourself a color wheel. Um, quite honestly, they're not they're not horribly expensive, um, and it'll just give you kind of a little bit of insight when you go to approach these. Because if you're if you're if you're doing a model that, quite frankly, isn't a replica or an attempt of a replica, it's something where you have um, an example to go off of that you're attempting to mimic. Um, if it's some sort of brand new creation and uh, you're looking at it going, okay, what's my color scheme going to be? Um, it's something to really think about, you know? And, and like I say, regardless of what you do in life, um, any time that you're getting ready to pick up a tool and work on something or, or approach something, um, my general approach, and it's held me in good stead, has been um, uh, look at, look at the, the problem or the project, um, give it some thought, formulate a plan, um, and formulate your steps mentally so that by the time you pick up a tool, you know not only what your current step is going to be, but what your next handful of steps are going to be. Um, and it keeps you from getting caught flat-footed, and it also minimizes the, the chance of mistakes. Um, now, that being said, you know, does that always happen? Uh, no, hell no, it doesn't. Uh, that's just the nature of the beast, you know? Everybody's going to have that weird off day where it really... They just slap their forehead and go, oh, hell, I know better. Um, but yeah. I think we're getting actually reasonably close to, uh, to the end of the gun metal. Just a little bit more, a little bit more detail work. Not much. I think I'm pretty, pretty happy with this all all. My little brother, um, you can follow him on uh, on Twitter, um, hashtag Belgian Boolean, that's B-E-L-G-I-A-N, B-O-O-L-E-A-N. Um, he's a, uh, an artist for, for Ubisoft. Um, I like the work that he does very, very much. Um, I'm actually doing this piece for him because he's a huge Aliens junkie. Um, I know it's probably sacrilege for me to say, for as much as I absolutely love science fiction, um, you know, Aliens is not really my cup of tea. I, I, I grew up watching it. Um, I think they hold up reasonably well, but um, they just make me tense. <laughs> just the, <laughs> they just make me tense. All right, well, I think, um, let's take one more pass through look here, but I think I'm okay with where it's at. Yeah. All right. Let's swap over and we'll do uh, we'll do our first layer of bone, and then uh, we'll see how well that coats, and we'll go from there. So give me a second. I'll be right back. All right. So that was uh, quick and easy. Here it's spare you the time. Probably could have left it running for as quick as the transition was. It's very very easy to uh, to drop your cup to rinse it out a little bit of hot water um, with these uh, with these water-based paints. Um, run it back through, you know, uh, backfill a little bit and that will flush your needle a little bit, dump that cup. If you do that a handful of times, uh, make sure you, you know, typically what I've got is I've got a, 
little squirt gun um, that I'll hit right down in the hole with just to kind of get it flushed a little bit. Um, and if there's a tiny little couple drops of water left in there, really, that's uh, that's not the end of the world. So um, for the bone portion, we're going to, again, be sticking with uh, Army Painter War Paints. Uh, we're swapping over to Skeleton Bone. Um, I like this color. Um, it makes for a really nice base coat. So we'll be kind of generous with it. Get it closed back up. And let's eyeball. You know, I, I'm, I'm really loosey-goosey with my ratios, as you can tell. Uh, you know, very rarely do I sit and count out drops. I just eyeball it. You get a feel for it. You know, follow follow the instructions on the bottle. They're, they're very clear. Um, but don't be afraid to just kind of play around with it. It gives you a lot of flexibility, um, depending on what you want the paint to, uh, to do. Uh, and there's the occasional time where you gotta do this a little bit, just to give it a quick stir in the pot and get your thinner uh, going with it. Just enough to get it liquefied. Awesome. Okay. Get that bubbling, just finish mixing it a little bit. Um, obviously, uh, very rarely do you ever need your pot to be all the way full. Um, the more full it goes, the more careful you need to be with uh, this technique because obviously it's going to start spattering um, like you did just now. There again, water base, not the end of the world. You do that with an oil base, um, get ready to have uh, grubby prop hands. That's what I like to call them, just is what is the nature of the beast. So let's, uh, let's do a test shot, see where we are with that. Oh yeah. Very, very cool. I really like the way they did this model too, where it's got the little hole in the in the chest cavity where the chest burster popped out. Um, I dig that. I like little bits of detail like that. So with us going a light color over the gray, it's much less forgiving uh, than it was with just doing the the gun metal. I keep getting hung up on that, but whatever. I guess it is. Um, it's much less forgiving um, because there again. Uh, similar colors, uh, not so similar colors. Um, and not just that, it's mixture. Um, you know, there again, I eyeballed it, I put in more thinner, and so naturally my paint is more thin. Um, if I maintain that half inch proximity that I have been uh, hitting, it starts to shove my paint around versus giving it an even coat. And that's a good technique for some things. If you need to, if you don't want to paint right up on something, um, but you want to kind of push the paint up in there, you can use that technique in this case here. I'm just going to have to back it off a little bit. Um, so, I, you know, I back off to probably about a, an inch, inch and a half, um, which just means I have to paint a little bit slower and a little bit more carefully uh, once I start getting into those, you know, those boundaries um, to make sure that I don't overspray. Um, and if you do, there again, it's all water-based. It's not that big of a deal. It's not the end of the world. You can come back in and spray right back over the tip of it. And and bear in mind too that, you know, we're just doing our, our, our base layers. Um, by the time you come in and do a wash and some, and some weathering in this, you know, it's like we were talking about, or like I was talking about, since I'm talking to myself on this one. <laughs> um, it, it, you can use your washes and your grime to, to hide your mistakes. So it's just, uh, you know, if you're into exactitude, uh, you know, whatever I crank out on here, if I do any more of these, um, I'm probably not gonna be cranking out anything that makes you super happy. Um, and there again, uh, you know, like we were talking, like, like I was talking about earlier, um, looking at a model when you paint it. So, for instance, you know, I kind of had a general idea of where my gunmetal was going to stop and where the boat was going to start. And it's not until I highlight something like this that I notice this little ledge right here, which his arm is resting on. So we'll have to come back through. I'll probably just hand paint that um, just to give it a little dash of gunmetal for, for separation. But it looked like just like any other line on his arm, 
until I highlight it in a separate color. Um, I like that sort of thing. You just kind of catch it and it goes, it makes you go, ah, oh, okay. There's, there's some thought process behind it that, uh, that says, you know, there's, there's a pra practical usage behind it. Um, and there again, you know, don't don't worry about getting these 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 perfect lines. You can see I already did a little bit of overspray here. Um, in an ideal world, I would have not thinned my paint so much, so I could have stayed closer. Um, so I goobered it a little bit. Um, is this going to be make or break? No. And there again, you see that I haven't sprayed as solid down here towards the bottom. Um, anytime that you go to paint a, a, a piece, think about lighting. Um, think about where you want the piece to be lit from. And so when you think about it, you know, there was a hole in the top of the ship. And when you look at it on the movie, um, the light is all sh kind of shining down and reflecting off of it. And so naturally, anything that's on the high points is going to be uh, brighter than the pieces on the bottom. Now, on a piece like this where it's sitting here, the natural light that's hitting it regardless of direction there's going to be parts that are going to be darker just of their own volition but with paint and going back to the layering technique um, you're not just layering for grime you're also lighting it with paint um, and that's where highlighting and shading come in um, and it's easy when you think about it it's just a logical pro pro progression um, if the light is up here all of your lit edges are going to be here. They're going to be on the top of uh, the, the, the the top of, of, of these where they come out. The top portions of him up here, maybe on the top of the skull. Not so much dead center because it's hidden up underneath this console. Um, the whole ridge line here. Uh, the tops of these pieces here. The outside edge here. Those are all going to be shinier hit portions. Whereas anything here along the bottom here, everything here, um, along the bottom, leading edges of these, um, that's all going to be a darker, a darker shade. And so, you know, plan your model accordingly and mentally light it and just think, you know, where is the light going to hit? Where am I going to need to highlight? And so one of the techniques here, because I've got a darker color underneath, is I'm not going to spray this solid because then it's well lit. Whereas if I just spray it like that, it kind of leaves this unfinished edge here that by its own nature just looks like a little bit of natural shading. And I'll end up enhancing that and blending and you'll never even notice um, that foobar. Instead, it'll look intentional. So it's easy to be um, a little sloppy with it and not kill yourself um, trying to hit perfection. Um, there's too many people that are just, you know, that approach me and they go, well, you know, I don't know how to paint or I, or I just can't do that. And I, and I go, look, this is, this is not rocket science. There's just some really basic steps that you do each and every time. And if you just take the time to sit and just think about it, the, techni the techniques themselves are not terribly hard to master. Not at, at least not the basic 101. Now, I'm, I'm certainly not on the same level as, uh, as some of these guys that I follow who are you know, award-winning uh, miniatures painters. Um, for me, I find that if you can paint gaming miniatures, those techniques will hold you in such good stead for painting anything larger, for cosplay stuff, uh, you name it. Um, it's, it's just really cool techniques for lighting. Um, and there's some of them that quite frankly, I haven't tried, I haven't, a lot of them I haven't mastered. You know, I just put, put along and do my thing and occasionally, I, you know, I play these 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 YouTube channels in the background, and I'll be painting something, and something will hit, and I go, "Oh, that's a really good idea. Let me try that," and I'll just implement. Um, it's a monkey see, monkey do proposition, um, which hopefully uh, this is for someone else out there. Hopefully, you know, someone who who thinks that painting is just beyond them. It's really not, man. Don't uh, don't sell yourself short. Um, just, just try. 
So you notice that here I'm leaving, I'm leaving all the, the lower edges that are transitioning. I'm doing the same thing as I did here where I'm just, uh, I'm gonna blend this a little bit just because I can clearly see my own, my own uh, uh, paint spot where I got too close. And then what will happen is if you, if you, if you airbrush properly, you'll, you'll do this. And I don't know how well, let's try this. If you do this, you can, you know, far enough back at probably about an inch and a half, you get a nice fuzzy dot. Um, if you get too close, it'll lay some paint. And then what it'll do, you can do some cool techniques with this where you can fish eye it to where you've blown most of the paint away in the middle and you get, side, get, get this outside ring. There's the occasional time. There again, think about your lighting. I know that this top leading edge is gonna be much, much brighter. So it's okay to come back and do a second pass, do a third pass. And, you know, ideally more layers are better than less. Um, and it's better to do it in layers, that way you don't apply too much paint and then have it do something squirrely on you. But you know, my main thought is everything up here, we definitely wanna make sure that uh, we get a really good solid coat on it and then everything to the side and down. You can get away with a, with, with a little bit less. You can get away with just a single pass and if some gray shows through, it's doing you nothing but favors. Just don't need to worry about being perfect with it. Think about your high points, 
hit them super hard. You notice I'm not spending a whole much of time trying to hit on the front face of this skull because it's in shadow. We just really want to lightly dust it, but not much more than that. I typically print uh, most everything at a, at a point two resolution. Um, I print, you know, most everything in uh, in PLA or um, or ABS. Um, for uh, PLA, I like the uh, Zero brand, Z I R O. Um, you can get it for like fifteen bucks a roll on Amazon, and once you get your machine dialed in, um, it prints really nice and smooth um, for my ABS um, I like to use a uh, Solutec um, 3d Solutec uh, they're an outfit just north of me out of, uh, out of Seattle um, they make a, a nice product um, their PLA prints really smooth as well um, but it's you know a little bit more expensive um, so why pay more for you know, something that prints just as well. It's just the nature of the game. Um, uh, the machines I use, I use a, a Creality uh, CR10 um, 4S. So it's not the S model, um, but it is a 4S. So it runs a uh, 400 by 400 by 400 uh, millimeters cubed. Um, and then my secondary machine is an Anycubic i3 Mega which has been just an absolute sweet part of a, of a machine. The CR-10 was my first. Uh, the learning curve on it was, uh, yeah, it was steep. I didn't really know what I was getting into, but I've learned a hell of a lot. It was uh, definitely trial by fire. And you know, like I tell most people who get really curious about it when they come over and they see the things that, I, that, that I'm making with this machine, um, you need to have a, a, a good, in my opinion, you either need to be a good learner or you have to have some good uh, mechanical aptitude uh, to keep the machines running. Um, I see some of these guys that uh, they strive for the perfect print. There again, um, you want that? Uh -uh. Go to a different channel. Um, if you, you know, I, I approach 3D printing um, with a different mentality because I've been building uh, model kits and uh, costumes and replica props for the last, I don't know, you know, God, you know, 15 plus years. Um, uh, 3D printing is a means to an end for me. Um, I don't strive for the most perfect thing, I guess because I take some pleasure in, um, if, if, if I get a print that's not perfect, um, you know, I, I have the, the skill set to, to nudge it um, and fudge it. So nudge it and fudge it. I guess that is going to be uh, that's going to be my, my lingo for the moment. Um, it, you just start to learn some some practical some practical skill set. I think that you know if you're going to print and and successfully finish your prints, unless you're just spray painting everything a monochrome color, um, you're going to get bored with that real quick. Um, if you want something cool that has some pop to it, um, make that effort. You've already learned how to use this machine and learn the software and, you know, you can only print other people's designs so much before you get the hunger to start using it to make your own dreams come to life. It's their dream machines. That's what 3D printers should be called, is dream machines. It's the perfect gateway to literally put a model together and print it and then, you know, in a relatively short period of time, um, have this thing. Um, it just, it's so convenient, uh, you know, and, and coming from, from, you know, years and years of hunting and waiting for runs or participating in runs or, or, or creating uh, uh, pieces um, of, of resin casts or vacuum-formed pieces, you know, or, or a whole slew of different materials, man, this is just easy-peasy, um, and 
working with plastics is always a sheer pleasure because they're just easy to work with, easy to fudge, easy to glue together. Um, it's a personal comfort zone, I guess. Try not to hover in one place too long. This is a prime example of letting yourself get a little too carried away and starting to lay just a little bit too much paint. I did it on the other side as well. I think it's just because I'm getting tired. There again, sorry guys, you know. But it's the nature of the beast. Uh, very rarely, unless you're a pro, is your paint job gonna be this, you know, object of perfection. Um, so, take it till you make it. Just, uh, you know, learn techniques for covering up your food bars and um, know that your mistakes give your pieces character, character that they would not otherwise have. Um, that's why in the movie industry, you know, you if you look at a prop and you are going to replicate it, 99% of the time they made multiple versions of that prop and very rarely are they identical. Um, and you'll learn that in the research phase if, you, if, the, if you're intrigued in going down that route. Um, why, you may ask? Because the single common denominator is people. We're just not perfect, and uh, chances are you're going to get tired, or you're going to be thinking about something else, or your hand's going to not be in the perfect place at the perfect time, and she's just going to cock it up. It's just the way of it. Accept it early. It makes it much easier to swallow. Not to say that there haven't been a few thrown wrenches here occasionally over one thing or another. You just have that moment where you're so close to the finish line and you may rush it a little bit. And uh, that's the other hurdle, you know, patience. Gotta have patience. Or if you don't have it, maybe this is a good, uh, a good uh, hobby to pick up if you don't paint. Um, it'll keep you patient or, or break you trying. <laughs> So I don't know, like I said, uh, you know, this is uh, this is test video for, for me just to see if there's anybody out there that uh, is interested in what little bit of information I have to share and uh, a little bit of conversation and seeing if these come together, you know, if, uh, if this inspires one person to go out there and be like, hey, I want to make some shit, then awesome. That makes me super happy. I just... Uh, like to encourage people to go out and put your hands on something get your hands dirty i don't care if it's working on your car and custom fixing it or customizing it or or you know go grab a paint job and paintbrush and paint something or or go grab some wood and make something out of wood or weld something you know what whatever you know tickles your fancy go make something it's good for the brain you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a vet, and uh, I'm pretty open about it. You know, I, I deal and cope with uh, depression, and uh, I find that the concentration and just the piece of painting um, seems to help. Tonight, it's, it's a nice outlet to uh, to just let my my brain be free for for a little bit. There's no responsibility. It's nice. It's nice to have that go with it. So um, I'm pretty happy with that and where it's at. You know, you can see where it's thin and we've got those gray areas where the gray is kind of showing through. And aesthetically, I dig that. You know, I don't, I don't, and realistically, you shouldn't want to just slather this thick coat of paint onto this thing because then it's just monochrome where with an airbrush, it gives you that ability to highlight and low light. Um, we'll do a little bit of that while I'm talking about highlights. So, you know, it's not a do as I say, not as I do scenario. <laughs> um, but, uh, and there again, I think that's probably the fourth or fifth time you've seen me come across that stretch. There's something to be said for, for making that extra effort to do multiple coats to, to highlight. Um, and if you're not sure, um, a really good technique I found is to take a picture of your item 
Um, and then look at the picture. Because there again, like our discussion about how your brain processes things differently when you when when you paint it, it's the, 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 the common thread is approaching something from a from a fresh perspective, from a new direction. Um, if you take a picture of your item with your phone and then look at the picture, don't look at your item, look at the picture. Um, and this goes quite frankly for when you think you're done. When you think you're done with your project and you're like, yeah, I'm ready to take some shots of this and, and post them up, post them up on the inner balls. Um, don't do that. Take take a picture of your shit first, um, because nine times out of ten you're gonna spot something in your picture where you're like, oh crap, I probably ought to do that. Um, it gives you that first fresh perspective, just to to you know, there again, not taking perfection, but um, you know, just to make sure that you know your shit doesn't look like however it's gonna look there again who who really cares uh, as long as you're happy with it that's uh, that's all that matters <clears throat> yeah I'm uh, sometimes it helps too um, if you're if you're to the point that I'm at here um, where we're highlighting um, angle picture where your light is coming down from spray from that angle um, that's that's really the the best way to ensure that you're you're hitting it properly um, so okay cool we'll uh, leave that there for now um, I'm pretty content with it so while uh, the bone is drying we're gonna go back and um, let's fiddle faddle with you know, um, taking a darker gray. Um, let's see what we've got over here. No, that's not quite the right color. Uh, let's do that. So this is just a little bit of matte uh, black. Again, we're sticking with the, uh, the Army Painter War Paints for the sake of this model. And for a little bit of consistency for this level, I'm gonna put away gun mount because I think I'm done with it. I think I'm gonna put away skeleton bone because I'm done with it. And uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to, you know, continue to move on with the theme of layers. So at this point, we've got um, a layer of primer. Um, we have a layer of base coat. Which we went with the gray. Um, we have a layer of gunmetal um, on the gunmetal bits. We have a layer of this bone color, skeleton bone on everything else. Um, we've already kind of done a little bit of the highlighting by just doing, you know, slightly thicker colors in the area where the light would hit and slightly thinner colors in the area that would be shaded. Um, so that gets us a pretty good chunk of the way there. Um, the hurdle now, um, as far as the gunmetal portions go, we're gonna take some of this matte black because, you know, chances are it's not like shiny grease and it's been sitting there for forever and a day. So a little bit of matte black, we're gonna thin it down like crazy. Um, so it get, turns into a wash. And the thinner you go, um, there again, think about what you want the paint to do chemically. Um, if you're painting, um, can you just dump this straight out and paint directly out of that blob onto your model. Um, sure, it's not gonna look good though. It's just the nature of the beast. Um, ideally, you wanna thin it a little bit. Even if it's not running through an airbrush, you wanna thin it a little bit um, so that it flows a little bit smoother. And so it doesn't give it just this thick, kind of clumpy coating. You want it to look natural. Like that's the goal of the paint job, right? Um, if you uh, are doing a stage like this, where you're now getting ready to um, do a, a darker accents, um, then you wanna thin it even further uh, because the goal is to you know, get it into the lower areas and then you can come back through and wipe the majority of it, of it back off. Um, you're just gonna let it settle into lower areas. And so it kind of gives you that, there again, that depth of paint job. And actually, while we're talking about that, I need more paper towels. I'll be right back. All right, so I walked away for a few minutes. Um, 
this sucker has had a chance to sit up and dry. Um, I still have plenty of the uh, skeleton bone left. Uh, so what I think we're gonna do, we're gonna take a little bit of this uh, uh, Army War Painter uh, Desert Yellow. Um, it's, you know, a few shades darker, but it's still kind of in the same family. Um, so I'm gonna see what a couple drops of that does. Um, and who knows, you know, it, it may not work, um, but I got a feeling it will. So we'll do a couple drops of it and just see if it dar darkens this up by just a shade. You don't want to go very far with it. Um, but we want it to be just a shade darker so that we can come back through and do the low lighting areas. Yeah, I think that'll do nicely. So that, we're gonna be lightly airbrushing um, along the bottom side of this unit. And that there, there again, that ties in with uh, like what we were talking about, you know, where's your, where's your light coming from? And this is gonna be a shade darker, not by much, but just a little bit. And with paint, you know, bear in mind, um, a little bit of a dark lighten it, you're going to end up adding so much of a lighter color to try and brighten it back up um, that it's almost not worth it. You're better off just to go to that lighter color. Um, it's just the nature of the beast. close you can actually see kind of the line of demarcation there um, where you tra start transitioning and don't worry about you know seeing the gray popping through up here because there again we're gonna go with a lighter version that's gonna you know kind of offset and highlight a little bit so it's not gonna be super critical and you still want some of the gray showing through underneath too um, so there again you know you're not looking to do a solid a solid coat. Really, I put a stronger coat here more just to show you the, or attempt to show you the, the difference in color and what two drops of that made. Um, and at least that way, you see that it, it really just doesn't, it doesn't take much at all um, to give you that slightly darker look and, uh, and help tie it all together and give you that, that, that shaded uh, light directional look that you're aiming for. A layer of dimensionality, I guess, is a good term for it. And there again, you know, I'm doing about a medium coat on it. If some of the gray goes through, that's fine. I'm not worrying about it being like this perfect. At this point, you're 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 well past the stage of needing your 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 coats to be this perfect uniform thing. At this point, you're not aiming for that, you're just kind of going by eyeball feel, keeping in mind, you know, what you're attempting to do with the paint. Um, and where you're coming up from somewhere that you know is going to be more shaded and dark, what you can do is you can, you know, like we angled for the highlights, you angle with the low lights. And so it's easy to go from solid to slightly higher, where you're now misting your paint thinner and thinner the higher you go. And what that does is that gives you a transition um, from the darker, more shaded shit up to the light.
All right, so that wraps up with that. Um, let me give it one more look just to make sure. Eh, there's one more spot right there. Squeeze a little bit more pink in there. It's easy to go overkill with it and, and then kind of ruin your effect. Um, okay, all right, that's it. So um, let me go change out my paint. Um, I'm gonna go back to uh, the gunmetal. I'm gonna do a base of gunmetal. And we're gonna do just like we did here, where you know we started off with, uh, with skeleton bone and we added two drops of desert yellow. And so you can see, um, you know, they're both same color family, just, just a handful of shades darker. Two drops of this was able to darken this up about one shade. up behind these pipes um, it's gonna be much easier to just do a shade darker on the gunmetal and airbrush those nooks and crannies and then what we'll do is we'll come back through we'll do some highlighting um, and then we should be able to do a good dark wash on this whole on, on, on the metallic bits and we'll do a medium wash on the bone and um, I'll walk through that and then I think we're in pretty good shape um, I may end up painting the bottom of this a black. I seeing it differently. Um, there again, this is one of those where, you know, I printed it, I felt like it was good to go, um, and started doing my paint, and the more that I was looking at it, I kept glancing down, and, uh, this bit here, um, the way that it printed, uh, a lot of the letters and the numbers were kind of partially filled in, um, and so I wasn't terribly keen on it. So I actually uh, went back through and kind of did some quick and dirty trembling, and I'm gonna grab a file and clean this up a little bit, and that way when we go to highlight it, um, it'll be more obvious what it's, uh, what it's trying to, to say. Of That's the other reason why I very much like uh, these Army Painter paints, and there are other brands that, you know, Vallejo does some of them that are like this as well, um, that come with these uh, little dropper tops. Um, quite frankly, you know, you look at a bottle like this and you think, well, gee whiz, that's not very much paint. Um, a little bit goes a really long way, um, and having that kind of fine control over it uh, is worth its weight in gold. So, let's do that, and let's start off with just, um, there again, in the, in the thought that a little bit of darkening goes a long way. Um, let me shake this real quick, actually, while I'm thinking about it. Um,
yeah, that one drop is noticeably different between uh, between the two. Um, I think that that's actually going to end up being the sweet spot without really needing to go overkill with it. Um, so let's get ourselves set back up here. Yep, I think that will do just fine. Yeah, so it's very subtle. Um, I don't know how well this is gonna pick up. Let's see if I can hit this leading edge with it. Um, no, you know what? Let's do one more drop. I think I'd like it to be just a little bit less subtle. Um, the other thing to think about too when you're when you're talking paints is sheen. Um, if you're getting ready to do um, something where you're you're highlighting a light source, um, you can get away with something a little bit shinier um, with a little bit of sheen to it. Um, because there again, you know, especially in a case like this, you're already hitting a metallic, so it's already reflecting a little bit of light. So should it continue to do so or enhance, that's not necessarily a bad thing. When you're doing shading, um, shading is dark. Dark is the absence of light. So ideally you wanna go with a flat sheen um, just to uh, accentuate. Yeah, that dried up and it's not noticeably different. I'm not sold that this is gonna be either. That's why I say sometimes this is a little bit of trial and error. Um, and that's why I say go slow. When you're mixing your paint, take your time. It's not a rush. Um, get it to where you want it, but don't take it too far. Because once you take it too far, you're, it's gonna be a real bugger to uh, come back from it. But yeah, that is a much better, better deal. I'm digging that. So this is the darker bit, there's the shinier bit. Hopefully that shows up in the light and gives you an idea of what a subtle transition it is. And the goal is for these paint jobs is to make it subtle. Um, you want the brain to just ha have the depth pop um, naturally without it looking forced. Um, that's always the hurdle with this. It's, if there's such a thing as too much of a good thing, I guess. Um, so you hit all of the areas metallic wise that you know aren't going to be getting any light and there again the nice part is because I didn't over thin my paint I didn't goof this time around that then enables me to on the areas where I'm shading if I got a little bit of bone colored overspray onto it, I can then flub it back the other direction. Um, so it's helpful, you know, think about your product, think about what they're doing. Um, you can always fix your mistakes. It's just sometimes it takes a lot more time than others to just be mindful of them. There again, look for the parts. Look for the parts where the light is naturally not hitting the model. Just accentuate them a little bit. Um, it makes a world of a world of difference. Spray in the nooks and crannies. Give them that fighting chance um, to shine on their own.
I think we're getting there. You get to the point to where, you know, you start looking at it and it's easy to overdo it. Um, but some of it is just a little bit of, of, of instinct. You're looking at it, you know, but there again, it's a logical progression. You know, think about where the highlights are. Um, you know, it's really hard because once I flip this up, the light is hitting this. Um, but when you're looking at it and the light is hitting it properly, um, the shadows are all, you know what? Hang on, we can do this better. Let's do this. So, you can tell where, you know, now we're still dealing with our initial color, um, but now you've got just enough shading. And there again, bear in mind, we're still gonna do a wash on this thing. So, you know, the really deep, deep areas are then gonna go yet one more layer darker. Um, so, yeah, that's a big one. But we're getting there slowly but surely. I think, um, you know, we'll end up doing, I'm pretty happy with the highlighting at this point. I'm really not feeling the need to do too awful much in the way of it. And this process is just, you know, any kind of paint job that you do, you know, you may end up thinking that you're gonna do these other steps only to discover that you may not necessarily need to. Don't feel like, don't feel, don't lock yourself into doing it one way, every way, every time. Just kind of let the process flow. Um, there again, plan ahead, know what you're gonna do, but kind of be willing to to adapt and overcome, you know, based on what the, the piece is telling you to do. Um, it, it may not, you may end up going overkill with it, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, with the metallic sheen being on there, it's just a much different ball game than, you know, paying something a little bit more organic. You just naturally get that metallic sheen, and so it, it naturally gives you the highlights that you're looking for. So, um, my inclination is to move on and do um, a medium wash on him, and then uh, we'll do a final uh, dark wash on the metallic pieces, and then let's see where we're at. If we need to do a little bit of post touch up from there, we'll uh, we'll see. Maybe we'll do like a really light, misted light color from an angle just to help accentuate. Um, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. So let me get us prepped and ready here. Two. All right, that should be safe. I think we're done with airbrushing, airbrushing for right now. Um, I haven't used my wet palette in the last several weeks because I've just been, summertime hits and uh, yes, this is why I love a wet palette. Um, literally, I have not opened up this thing in probably four weeks. Um, and yet my, so basically, um, if you haven't looked it up, if you don't know what it is and you give a damn, um, you can go buy yourself, you can make yourself a wet palette. Go buy yourself a nice uh, shallow Tupperware with a good ceiling lid. Um, that's important to this whole thing. Go buy yourself uh, at the grocery store, the same damn place. You can go get yourself a tube uh, right next to the aluminum foil. Get yourself some parchment paper um, and get yourself a roll of paper towels. And so you just take your paper towels and um, take a couple sheets and fold them probably three or three or four times. You want a piece, you know, when all said and done, you probably want it to be about an eighth inch thick, maybe a little bit deeper. It's really not that big of a deal. It's not critical. And then uh, cut a piece, you know, the size that will fit. Give yourself a little bit extra so that your edges can come up in the corners. Um, cut yourself a piece of parchment paper to fit. And parchment paper, because it comes off the roll, naturally wants to curve. Um, put the curving side down. It will help hold it in place. And then you wanna get yourself, you know, a glass of water. And um, you're only going to put, um, let's say, maybe about an eighth of a cup. An eighth of a cup of water and pour it in at the corner or at the corners, I should say, so that the paper towel can start to uh, absorb the moisture. And what will happen is that the, um, the paper towel absorbs the moisture, the parchment paper acts as a semi-permeable layer so that your moisture can come up and through. Your paint can technically bleed down and through. Like if you haven't changed your water in a while, your water will start to turn a weird fucking color. Don't be weird about it. It's not mold or anything growing. It's just your paint slowly absorbing into the water. Um, 
But what it does is it then allows you to put a couple drops of paint in here. You can even add a couple drops of uh, airbrush thinner or, or just thinner um, or a little bit of water in it um, to thin your paints down. And you can dab and let's say, you know, you're painting and you're like, well, crap, okay, that's it for the night, but you want to pick the project up tomorrow? You just slap the lid on it, leave it overnight, come back tomorrow, or in this case, Christ, if I wanted to use a you know, well, now these are kind of toast at this point, but um, if you want to come back a couple days later, you know, it, they'll still be wet and ready for you to move on, so you haven't just wasted that paint, um, which is a, a really nice thing to have. Um, and not just that, it, it helps thin out your paints and make them, like we talked about, super smooth to, um, and the nice part about having it dry like this is that I don't then have to worry about wiping out those paints. But that's the cool part is if you want to change colors and you've worked in this corner and you've worked in this corner and you've worked in this color and now you're going to, I don't know, freaking bright pink, that's the color that you need for whatever project. You can literally come through with a paper towel and just wipe it right off of the parchment paper and get like 90 plus percent of that paint off to where it, thin, it gets it away enough that you can now start with that pink without having to swap to a new piece of parchment. And quite frankly, you just bought a whole roll of parchment, so it's not hard to put a couple new paper towels in it and put a fresh parchment paper and literally just refresh your whole unit, which I do, you know, probably uh, a couple times a month. It's just one of those things, depending on how much I'm painting. If I'm painting a lot, then yeah, this may, you know, get changed. The guts of this may get changed out on a weekly basis, but. Um, very rarely, quite honestly. I think I've, I've had this thing for like eight months or so, and um, I've only changed this out like three times, because um, it works, it just does the job. But this is a really, really slick setup. So, um, sticking uh, with the, sticking with the, the, the theme that we've got going, um, when you're going to do a wash, um, ideally you want kind of a bigger, fatter, fluffier brush. Um, you don't really have to go out and go buy fancy, stupid, high-end uh, brushes. Um, there are some uh, that are a little bit nicer to have. They've got sharper tips, so you can do really fine work with them. Um, but quite frankly, you know, you can buy those down at Michael's or your local craft store, and they'll do the job just fine. For the purpose of a wash, you know, bear in mind, um, it's kind of like paint, but it's kind of not like paint. It's got like a tiny little bit of pigment in it, and then the majority of it is thinner. And so it's designed, just like it says, to basically you just brush it on liberally. It's gonna get down in the nooks and crannies and it's gonna settle on its own. And then you look for the areas where maybe it's gotten a little bit too thick and you can dab it with your paper towel. Um, but otherwise leave most of it sit. Um, so for the, the purposes of, of the bone on here, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a, a flesh tone wash. We're gonna start with a lighter, a lighter wash to begin with, I think. Let me double check my, my stuff here. Um, Although, you know, no, let's do a sepia wash. So, you know, your, your washes dictate the colors. You typically have, you know, a light, a medium, a dark, you get a flesh tone, um, you need a sepias. Um, so we'll do, a, we'll do a dark tone wash on the metal and we'll do a sepia wash, which is gonna kind of yellow uh, the bone out a little bit further and just kind of make it look that much more aged. And if we have to come back and do a second wash over it in a darker color, um, there again, that lends itself to the whole uh, layers theme, right? So at this point, as long as you remember to start light and go dark, um, you'll be okay. So it doesn't take very much. Um, just kind of dab it. And you notice right away, you see how much it thins out. Um, yeah, just come over here and just brush it in. Just work it in. Let it do its thing. It's going to get down in those nooks and crannies. It's going to give it that weathered that weathered look. And just like the concept of highlighting, um, you can come back through and rub the high points and then it has just given you a whole new layer of subtle shit down in the
I know it's a funny concept if you're not familiar with doing this to wipe paint or pigment onto something just to turn around and wipe it back off. Um, but you know, it's it's like dry brushing or anything else. There's just a little, you know, dry brushing. You're just going to have your wet pigment. You're going to dip your paint in it, and then you're going to sit and wipe the majority of it off on a paper towel until there's not much left. And you think, well, why couldn't I just put a little bit on the paintbrush? Well, it's just the physical act of doing it changes the way it hits the paintbrush and how it ends up getting applied to, uh, to the model. Um, but there again, you know, it, it gives us just that extra layer, that subtle shading, just enough to, to, to do what we want it to do and make it, I don't know, you know? Um, there again, not advertising myself to be an expert by any stretch of the imagination. I do what works for me. And if you haven't done this before, um, you're gonna pick up a brush and over time, and experimentation and failure, because there will be failures, just the nature of the hobby. Um, you're gonna figure out what works for you. Um, you may end up being in the same shoes that I have, where you share what works for you, and who knows, someone else may replicate it and go, oh, hot damn, that, that really does work good for me. Um, and someone else may be, you know, naysaying. It's just the nature, it's the nature of the thing. What works for some may not work for all. Um, and the more I look at it, the more I'm kind of inclined to try the sepia wash for some light rust effect on the, uh, on the metal. I think that could come out looking really And what you can do too, if you're really unsure, is there again, remember you can just spray air with this thing. Come back and blow your wash around. You can uh, you can do some really cool shit with, with that as well. Come back, wipe your excess off, but you can get your, your wash to work its way into nooks and crannies that it maybe otherwise wouldn't have.
Yeah, okay. So, moving on from that, because it's water-based, we can just clean our brush up. And then, let's come back through, and let's do a dark wash. Soft tone, strong tone. Strong tone will do the job. about it all through here. Let's make sure we get a good good coat of it. And there are times when you are painting this where what you're doing seems so inherently wrong that inside your brain you're just going, oh my god, I'm fucking this paint job all up. And um, then you know you start going back through and wiping stuff off and uh, yeah, turns out you didn't. You just made it better. Off. And use this to nudge it back up where you want it and get it to force itself down into the nooks and crannies. And it's so thin, like I said, you know, don't don't forget that you can use your tools in multiple different ways. But uh, 
Let your airbrush do some of the work to force it up into the nooks and crannies. It, it may not always need that kind of help. It depends on the model. You know, in this case, I'm just I'm dealing with some tight ones. Um, it's liquidy. Um, my brush is nice and soft, so it can reach those areas. But even with that, you, you may not be happy with it. You, know, you may be like where I'm at right now, where you're like, eh. So, what I'd like to do now is let's swap over. Let's swap over to a soft tone, and we'll hit the top with a soft tone. And you go, well, okay, well, why? Because we've got main light hitting it. The goal is just to pick up some of the details and, and to give it a little bit of offset highlight. Uh, we're not going to do anything super major with it. We just want to... Take like that, it, it's perfect. It's a perfect chance to just kind of go, hey, look, you know, it is the mistake easier to to uh, to avoid initially? Um, yes, but it happens more often than <laughs> my life. So here's where, how we're going to handle this. We're just going to spray at distance with that color, and we're just going to lightly hit it just a little bit, just enough to highlight back some of the stain off. Just remember, layers. Layers are key to this whole thing. And so quite frankly, if you goober it a little bit, and you gotta come back through to fudge it a little bit, all it does is just give you a little bit more detail.
happy with that. I think that looks really good. We'll feather and blend that just a little bit more, I think. All right, so um, that kills it for that. Let me do um, another quick color change. Um, what are we going to do next here? Um, I think what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to put in a little bit of just a tiny little bit of silver and then we are going to do a high point hit with the silver to make it pop um, and give it just a little bit extra oomph um, and then I'm going to come back in and uh, I'm going to try. I have not used this yet. Um, it's Vallejo model wash for uh, rust effects. It's a light rust and um, I'm looking forward to using it. I'm going to, it looks like it's, it's, it's nice and thin like a regular wash. I'm going to come back in and, and use it very sparingly in just little key spots to give us an extra little effect. And then uh, this, I think this thing's going to be ready for clear coating. I think it's getting to a point where I'm, I'm very, very happy with it. Um, so give me a check a second. Let me change my, uh, my paint and um, we'll give the silver a shot. All right, so we've got the paint, uh, or airbrush, excuse me. Um, the airbrush is all rinsed out. We've still got this a tiny little bit of water in there, but no big deal. I mean, you, know, you kind of hear me talk to myself and um, second guess myself sometimes, maybe go back on a decision that I may have said I was going to do 10 or 15 minutes earlier. It's a process um, and the trick is, is learning little skills here and there and quite frankly there's a whole slew of YouTube channels um, that will teach you, um, hopefully mine in the future may be one of them. Um, if this is successful and I continue on, if folks, I don't know like my conversational style, I guess. Um, but uh, you can pick up these skills. Yeah, okay, that's gonna work out real nice. Okay, so we know that, um, that our focal point is here up top. Here's where you keep your airbrush well away. And here I'm talking like I'm a foot away and I'm barely gonna spray any. And then I'm progressively gonna spray a little bit more and the goal is to start having it hit the high points and start to just make them shine a little bit. And it's easy to go really overkill with it. Um, but otherwise you can achieve a really cool effect. And I'm dropping down, you know, I'm just kind of playing it, playing it by ear. I'm hitting high points. Um, just, to make, just enough to make them gleam. Just a little bit, that's all it's gotta be. We'll do the top of the gears and a little bit around the top of the base here. where you can just hit edges that you think are important. Um, but, you know, be aware, it makes it much easier to, you know, overdo something. The teeth on the base, we're not hitting the fronts and the back because they're buried up underneath. Um, now, as far as this goes, you know, how it initially, I'm going to stick with that plan. Uh, this is going to get painted black and then we're going to, we're going to go through with a, a silver Sharpie. Sharpies, um, metallic Sharpies um, are big go-tos for me. I always keep them in stock because if you have anything with raised lettering, raised detailing, 
um, a weapon that you're painting that has little details and you want to just do a really fine worn silver edge man you can come along with a sharpie and you can do some really cool shit and no one will know the, the difference quite frankly it works really really well so that uh, gets us about out of the silver um, I think we're done highlighting there I'm pretty happy with that um, let's put a little bit more right here I guess a little bit more right there and right there so I'm kind of done That's the way these things go um, I'm just gonna do it as you see it <clears throat> better to see it I guess before you clean the paint out right and then um, let me paint this black highlight this silver and then we'll do a little bit of rust effects and I keep putting that off evidently um, bu -bu 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 -bu, and then this thing can set up and then we'll clear coat it and then it's uh, it's done so it'll uh, be prepped and ready to uh, ship off to my brother to be at a new home but that right there I keep forgetting that you guys are not looking at it from my perspective but you know if you look you can see uh, you can see the difference in the shading you can see your height your highlight points um, you can see your multiple layers and start to kind of get that that layer of understanding huh. uh, layer of understanding about you know what these do and um, Bring that back to a little bit of a metallic. Um, I'll do that there too. Um, but yeah, you start to get a, a feel for you know what should be highlighted, what shouldn't, and different shades of metallic going from a silver and a gunmetal, you know, and a little bit of a dark wash to get down in the nooks and crannies. It just starts giving you this feel of this old used thing and this old dead used creature um, so yeah you know that's the goal hopefully this is helping someone quick and dirty color change got it all rinsed out you know realistically we're talking less than 20 seconds to just rinse a little bit out um, here we're just going to paint the base we're going to do it in black so let's just put a couple of dollops of black doesn't have to be anything super major in here um, we'll get some thinner That's the downside, you start to thin it, and it, it'll get away from you real quick. It'll start to run real quick, so you gotta keep moving with it. You do a little bit at a time. Um, if you stay in any one spot too long, it'll get too thick and it'll start to run on you, so just be mindful of that when you're thinning your paint, that that's the trade-off, um, and your technique needs to change to go along with it. So rather than hovering in a spot, constantly on the move and then you give it a chance and then you come back and get another area of it um, um, for those that are interested um, this was printed in orange um, Excuse me, I'm getting tired. Uh, 3D Solutech ABS, um, and I'm leaving the base of it orange um, so that I can permanent marker a note to my brother on it and date and sign it. And uh, that way, when you pick it up, you know you always know it's a it's a 3D printed piece. I like that. You know, some I've heard some people say, "Oh, well, 3D printing is cheating." Well, you know, I've done uh, molding, I've done casting. Um, uh, I think it's just another means to an end. Uh, it's not cheating. It takes it takes a lot of work in its in its own way. Um, so right here, I think um, I'm going to do some really really light and just barely noticeable um, bits of of black um, in some of the nooks and crannies, just to give it. one extra controlled layer because I feel like it 
And that's the way this works sometimes. Sometimes it just hits you and you go, eh, I'm gonna do that because I think it'll look cool. And really, we just finished doing the exact same thing with the silver. So we're just gonna do it inverted with the black. Just very light, very gentle, not an overdue by any stretch of the imagination. Shows through, and so you can get away with quite a bit. Um, I'm sorry if I go kind of quiet, but just one of those where you start to kind of stick your tongue out of your mouth, make a funny face, and concentrate super hard on what you're doing. And some of you may go, Well, if you're going to do this initially, then what was the point of the wash? Um, there again, my, my response to that is layers. Um, and I started this whole program under that premise of you know, layering. Layering is just key to having a finished um, paint job that looks realistic. It's not two dimensional and that takes into account everything from, you know, the, the weathering to, and every little layer that you do leaves something behind. Um, you're constantly, you know, as long as you're not doing solid layers, you're always going to see some vestige of, uh, of a previous layer. And I think that's what I like so much about it. Um, you just constantly give it a little extra oomph. Okay, cool. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. I think we're good. Um, let's come through. Let's do a little bit of rust wash and some really, really key spots. I want to keep it to a minimum. Just a, a faint hint of it, and especially since I'm not familiar with this wash, I'm going to be learning as you're watching because uh, balls to the wall. That's how this works. So, airbrush is cleaned up quick and dirty. Uh, looks like all my paints are capped off. Nice to double check that, make sure I'm not goobering anything anywhere. Um, at this point, we can do like I was talking about earlier with. Uh,
where would it collect, where would it start to get to, um, how much of an effect is it going to have. Realistically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get it on my brush and I'm going to let the, the paper towel soak up the majority of it so that whatever I put on here, it's, it's minor at best. So we're just gonna we're gonna lightly because at this point you want it to accentuate something. You don't want it to take away from the model, right? So just little hints here and there. Just enough just to give it a little extra. Um, that's the nice part about 3D printing is if you find a nook or a cranny, like right here where it's kind of printed fucked up, um, that's a prime candidate to, uh, or not that it didn't print it fucked up, I guess, it just didn't print perfectly. looks good and um, I think that's where we're going to stop it. You guys really don't need to see me friggin' spraying a, a clear coat. I'm going to let it dry for a bit. So, I don't know. You know, I'm going to edit this video together and I'll throw it on up 
and I'm sure it's really long-winded. I don't know how long this paint job took me. I guess I'm probably at like a two-hour mark. So I guess I'll probably break it up into 30-minute segments. And, um, you know, feel free. If you happen to take the time to watch it and you feel like you got something out of it, um, pipe up. Um, if you have feedback, good or bad, pipe up. Um, if you're going to be a troll and just call me a douchebag, well, either get it out of your system or please don't. Um, move on. Find something more productive to do with your life and your time. Um, there's got to be something. Go find something to paint. That'd be a good start. Um, otherwise, um, for anybody who, who did stick around and watch it, thank you. Um, it's nice. It's nice to, to have somebody um, give it a shout, and hopefully uh, it was entertaining and you learn something from it. So hopefully until next time. Thanks. Bye.